Congress in this, that period between uh, our removal and Armageddon when Israel stoops to the lowest in its history. It's the Valley of Ajalon. Well, we're standing uh, on the northern rim of the Valley of Ajalon, which runs right up to Beth Horan, the lower, and Beth Horan, the upper. And this is very important because it is the record of Joshua 10 that tells us how critical this is for the future, not just for the past. So you know the record of Joshua 10, but let me just lead you to it. The book of Joshua, from chapters 1 to 12, lays out the entire work of Christ from his second advent until a time when God is all and in all and there's only one nation left on earth. Every detail you want can be found in the first 12 chapters of Joshua. I won't go into the earlier chapters, I'll start with chapter 6. Chapter 3, 4 and 5 have to do with the redemption of the saints and their glorification and immortality. Chapter 6 is the Armageddon chapter. It's the chapter of sevens, you remember. The number seven occurs there in many different ways. For example, it's the 21st occurrence of the name Jericho, three times seven. The, the word for trumpet occurs there 14 times, and so on and so on. You have, of course, Israel coming <coughs> to Jericho, and we know that there are, there are seven priests, <coughs> that they, they go around the city on seven days, <coughs> over seven days and seven times. So there are uh, seven trumpets, seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days, seven times. And that's actually the foundations of the apocalypse, your seven seals. Well, what do priests do? What, what's the job of a priest? Malachi 2 verse 7, to unseal the word of God. Isaiah 29, they gave the scroll to the priest and said, here, you can read this. He says, no, it's sealed. See? The job of a priest is to unseal. So you have seven seals, seven trumpets, seven periods of judgment or days, right? seven vials of the wrath of God, and they've been going on since 1789, and we're in the sixth, and we're near the end of the sixth, and then you have the seven times around the city, and it collapses. See? This is the seven thunder judgments of Revelation chapter 10. So Joshua 6 is the Armageddon chapter. Joshua 7 is the first thing that happens after Armageddon, the cleansing of the house of Judah. Because, of course, Achan was of the family of Judah. Chapter 8 sees the entire nation brought into the bonds of the covenant. This is exactly what will happen. The Christ will redeem the Jews in the land, those who remain, and Elijah will be working with the rest to bring them into the bonds of the covenant. Chapter 9 is about the submission of the nations immediately after Armageddon, the Tarshish powers. Gibeon was a royal city and so the Gibeonites were attacked by uh, the confederacy that was put together uh, by Adonai Zedek. Okay? And so they have submitted to Christ but they do it with a deceitful heart. And Psalm 66 verse 3 and Psalm 18, 18 verse 44 tell us that that's exactly what the nations are going to do post Armageddon. The Tarshish powers will come to Christ and they will lay down their weapons and say, well, we're not going to fight you. But they don't come to be made into Christadelphians any more than the Gibeonites came to be made into Israelites. But they ended up exactly in that position. And then we come to chapter 10. And chapter 10 has, of course, great importance in relation to what's going to happen to the Catholic harlot system. Because you read of a man called Adonai Zedek, who's king of Jerusalem. This man probably thought he was a descendant of Melchizedek. And, of course, king of Jerusalem just happens to be one of the titles of the Pope, which he adopted in the time of the Crusades. And he puts together a confederacy of five kings. You see, it's a confederacy of grace. It's based on religion. And he comes out against Israel. Now you know the story. Israel goes out to fight. This battle starts up there on the heights of Beth Horon. And they're pushed down here in the valley of Ajalon. And great hailstones are finally brought down, selectively killing the Canaanites 
leaving the Israelites free. And that day is extended, as you know. Verse 12 of Joshua 10. Then spake Joshua to Yahweh in the day when Yahweh delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel and said in the sight of Israel, Son! The sun's bearing down upon us. Son! Stand thou still upon Gibeon. Gibeon's just up the way. And thou moon in the valley of Agilon. This valley. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher, the upright one? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. It was an extended day. And there was no day like that, before it or after it, that Yahweh hearkened unto the voice of a man. And here's your important phrase. For Yahweh fought. For Israel. Now what immediately follows, of course, is the capture of the five kings, their crucifixion, their burial in the abyss. And then you have, in Joshua chapter 10, the listing of seven cities that Israel take, you see, because this is the seven campaigns of Christ, like the seven campaigns of David and the seven campaigns of Joshua, played out over 40 years. So this extended day is a type of the 40 years between Armageddon and the total subjugation of the nations. How do we know that? We know it from the context because that phrase is repeated towards the end. It says this, before there's a rest period, like the millennium will be, a rest period, it says this, and all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time over an extended day because Yahweh, God of Israel, fought for Israel. Now those words are quoted in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14 is all about Armageddon and the 40 years that follows it. So when we read in Zechariah 12, 13 and 14, 20 odd times, the day, the day of Yahweh, it's not an ordinary day. It's the extended period of 40 years. Look at the events that have to occur in Zechariah 12, 13 and 14. It takes, it will take 40 years. And it says in Zechariah 14, and here are, the, here are the words that follow that verse that says that I will gather all nations uh, against Jerusalem to battle, etc. Verse 3 says, Then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. That day of battle is the battle of Joshua chapter 10. So the great thing, brethren, for us as we stand here in the Valley of Achalon is we have this wonderful type in the Word of God of the work that we're about to be involved in. The work of the destruction of the Gogian host in this land, then the work of 40 years to subdue all the nations, some of whom will submit with a deceitful heart initially, but it'll be our job to teach them the truth, that they might be involved in the building of the house of God, just like the Gibeonites were, involved with the work of the house of God. It'll be our job to clean up, under the Lord Jesus Christ, all of the filth and rubbish of the nations and all of their wrong doctrine. And it will be accomplished in an extended day, like there was here in this valley. And Yahweh will once more fight for Israel. Here we are. The one thing I forgot to mention up in, uh, as we looked over the Valley of Agilon, was the fact that in Revelation 16 verse 21, uh, Christ talks about how the Babylonian system, Babylon the Great, will be destroyed by great hailstones from heaven, just like it was in the Valley of Agilon. And he specifically mentions the weight, about 100 weight. You know? So what is that? What does that mean? Well, it's not talking about literal hailstones there any more than it's talking about a literal earthquake. That's a political earthquake, the third of the apocalypse that will see the establishment of the kingdom. If you take someone who's about 100 kilograms, we've got someone 100 kilograms here. Ronnie, come on, you're, you're an ideal candidate for this. Oh. A little less than 100 kilo, but okay. close. Now, if this man here is made immortal, and I'm sure one day he will be by the grace of God, 
He's going to lose his heart, nine and a half pounds of blood, liver, kidneys, most of his stomach, probably all of it, which is probably a good thing, and all the stuff that you don't need for mortality. So guess what weight he's going to be? About 45 kilograms. It's a hundred weight. So when Christ talks about the great hailstones that would destroy the spiritual Babylon, uh, he's talking about the saints as the weapons, just like the hailstones the weapons in the Valley of Ajalon. Well, we're now standing with Sora in the background. We've just briefly had a look at Eshtaol, and of course we know the story of the tribe of Dan. They were the second largest tribe, some 62,000 men above the age of 20, <clears throat> when they came into the land. They were given a very large territory, which included portion of Philistine territory, Amorite territory, etc., in this entire region here, quite a large portion of land. But they didn't take it. They could not take it. They didn't have the faith to secure their inheritance. And progressively they were pushed mm -hmm. onto the mountain range that we've just traversed uh, on the eastern side, from Eshtaol to Zora. Now, see, it's not very long, is it? It's just a few kilometres. That was the area that they were pushed into, up on the heights. And the Philistines dominated down here, the Amorites to the north. So they had a problem. So what was Yahweh going to do? This was the sixth cycle of Israel's apostasy in the book of Judges. What was he going to do? He's going to provide one who should have been a great type of his son. That's why in the record of Judges chapter 13, you don't read of the name uh, of, of uh, Manoah's wife. She's just called the woman. And 14 times you have the word Isha used in Judges 13. Seven of those are with the article the woman. She's clearly set forth as a type of Mary, the mother of the Son of God. And she, in fact, was the true Nazarite of the family. She was the one to keep the Nazarite vow. She was spiritually intelligent and she brought forth a son. And look at the, the pregnancy, if I might use that word in that context, of the language that it says, and the woman, the woman, this is Genesis 3.15, isn't it? The woman bear a son and called his name Samson. Bright sunlight, it says, uh, in, if you look up the lexicons. Why? Well, they'd just seen the angel of God, and she's naming him after the face, the visage of the angel of God who appeared in his brilliance before them. Okay, so she names the son after the angel. And we read this, and the child grew, and Yahweh blessed him. You could almost be reading Luke 2.72, couldn't you? Our Lord Jesus Christ, the child grew, and Yahweh blessed him. And the spirit of Yahweh began to move him at times. Now in the Hebrew there is no equivalent to the phrase at times uh, in the English. This word here in the Hebrew means to agitate. The spirit of Yahweh began to agitate him. And this is exactly what happened to you and me when the truth started to take hold of our lives. True? The spirit of Yahweh begins to agitate. Well, what does it do to him? Well, it agitates him in the camp, camp is a temporary place, isn't it? It's not a permanent place. In the camp of Dan, between Zora and Eshtaol. Now, let's go back and explore the roots of the name Dan. We know that Dan means judgment. That's just one of its developed meanings. The original meaning of Dan was based on Rachel saying, when she had a, had a son through Bilhar, saying, Yahweh's chosen me, right? Yahweh's chosen me. She's now in the race with Leah to produce children for Jacob, and she's got Bilhah producing sons. See, Yahweh's chosen me. The original idea of the name Dan has got to do with judgment. Yeah, to be sure, but the judgment of choice. Choices being made. So think about this. Here's Samson, born, he's supposed to be a type of Christ, the seed of the woman. He's born in a temporary abiding place, in a place where you have to make choices, judgments. So what are these places? Sora and Eshtaol. Now Eshtaol means in the Hebrew, entreaty. Someone entreating. Now we have a nature that's constantly entreating us to go its way. Natural bias in man. And there are voices that come outside, from outside of us that come from that same source, isn't it? Voices of entreaty. Come my way. Come on, come my way. Just like the, the Philistine girl down here at Timnath. Now just like Delilah, a little later on in the Valley of Sorek, 
You know what this valley is here we're standing in? The Valley of Sorek. All right? We're here in the Valley of Sorek. Goes off, runs off down to the land of the Philistines. So Samson's situation is set forth as a type of our, of our own trials. We have to make, because we're in a temporary abiding place, choices every day, don't we? Some of them are pretty big choices as to whether we're going to obey the voices that come from within and from without, or whether we're going to obey the voice of the Spirit. And it's the Spirit that is symbolised by the town Zora. Zora means a wasp. A wasp as sting. The hornet has rendered in other places. It's the root of that word hornet. I will send the hornet before you, said Yahweh to the land, and they'll drive out the Canaanites. Well, what was that? <coughs> the Spirit of God working through the angels, overshadowing Israel. It was Yahweh's Spirit that would drive out the Canaanite from their inheritance, and it's Yahweh's Spirit word that will drive out the problem we have, the Canaanite nature that we have, constantly wanting to go the way of the natural voices of man. Samson didn't succeed, did he? Until the end. And the end came in Judges 16. And it says this. When he push, pushed the temple of the Philistines down around their ears, you know, the place where they were celebrating victory over him and over the God of Israel, it says this. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zora and Ishtayol in the burying place of Manoah his father and he judged Israel 20 years so which town was he closer to when the end came well we are told in Judges 13 and at verse 2 and there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah they normally buried people in their hometown Samson was buried in the place that symbolises the spirit. And you know, his example is very important to us. It's between Zora and Eshtael, but it's much, much closer to Zora than to Eshtael. By the time we get to the end of our probation in the camp of choice, brethren, we're not going to be perfect, are we? The spirit's not going to be have done a perfect job because we don't allow it to. We're like Samson. We go up and down like Samson. There are times when we're strong in the truth, there are other times when we're terribly weak. But eventually, if we're prepared to let God work, let this book work, the Spirit is going to win out in our life, as it did, finally in the life of Samson. he had taken 46 cities, but not Jerusalem, Libna or Lakey.
is Ashdock coach, but we're uh, driving into Ashdock towards the ocean. Don't have to go to Sydney either. Look at all of them. Look. What's this getting? What's the wheels? Seven sails right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine, eight, seven, six, seven, seven, seven. standing uh, on the southern side of uh, Herod's harbour at Caesarea. There's some fishermen here working away, there's a yacht that's been tied up and anchored in the harbour. Here is now I'm pulling up the anchor and going on its way. <laughs> 